So we still have this gap of about a third that we have to, we have to fix. We do. And so there's different perspectives on it. If nuclear, either in fission... Mm -hmm. or fusion, and right down the road from me is one of the big hopes for fusion at Lawrence Livermore right. National Lab. One of those could fill that. The other one that's that, that's got some real well, problems but could do it is that if we can capture the emissions from burning natural gas, so carbon capture and storage, as it's called, that could buy us some time, maybe even a couple decades, but the whole life cycle of burning fossil fuels, whether it's coal, oil, or gas, isn't just about the problems of CO2 emissions. It's also about local air quality. It's yeah. about land disruption. And so that one looks like a challenge. And yeah. so, you know, you, you, there's at least a couple big tens to look at, the nuclear one, the, the, the gas one. And when I look at where we could go, I can see, you know, keeping those both of those bets alive. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we to, to, these are big bets, and we need big funding. Yeah. And the energy research budget in this country, except for a brief blip under Carter, and then a brief blip under Obama in the stimulus package, is at a level that's comparable to the R and D budget for pet food. Yeah. And so. We are not treating the solutions side of this equation very well yet. So that that you know gives me a segue to my last question, really, which is uh, uh, this is a class in which uh, the people enrolled in it are trying to figure out what can they do, however small, to um, encourage change that will address these issues. And uh, it sounds like figuring out building a social consensus for research uh, or R and D is, is is at least one of those factors. What else would you suggest to our students? Yeah, I mean R and D is one, but but there's so many other things that we need to do much more immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, um, I dare say, except for a few nerds like myself, when you go turn on a light switch around the world, you have no idea what that means up there. Right. And so, getting educated about the energy mix not just in kind of an academic way, but what does it really mean in terms of health effects? There is thankfully a thriving but still small movement around energy and environmental justice. Yes. President Clinton signed an executive order to make environmental justice an issue so you can't discriminate against people, uh, 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 minorities or disadvantaged people with bad energy choices and pollution. So making that clear is part of the story. But the other one is that there are really significant things that we can do now. Politicians respond very well to one thing, and that is constituent interest. Yeah. And if constituents show an interest, we see politicians shifting, even in some of the, the really coal areas, there's a recognition this is not good locally. And so, for example, a number of universities right now are looking at the carbon story in very similar ways to the way we looked at apartheid. Right. And so just last week, the faculty at Cornell voted to divest the Cornell portfolio from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I wrote an op-ed in the Berkeley paper a couple weeks ago that's generated a whole fury of activity around divesting from fossil fuels at UC Berkeley and the whole UC system. Harvard had a recent vote where they voted not to divest, right. and I think they made the wrong choice, but you get different arguments about should you remain quote unquote inside and, and change from within. I'm very, uh, very much moved by the statements that Nelson Mandela made. In fact, when he came to California and he spoke in Candlestick Park, which is being torn down in a few weeks uh, where the 49ers play football, yeah. he said, you in California, you need to keep up the pressure. My people are going to suffer in the short term by you uh, having sanctions against South Africa, but it is absolutely necessary. And I think a story like that is needed here, where I don't want to see us try to, it would be impossible to divest overnight, but I would like to see it so that responsible portfolios decarbonize in just the same way that we're talking about places like California and Germany and Denmark and Portugal and Korea see themselves as decarbonizing. And so I see there's a big effort in terms of getting our financial house to catch up with what we know we can do technologically. And that's a place where people far outside the energy and climate field are central. 
that's the world of banking and investment houses yeah. and sovereign funds and pensions. And that's another big arena where there's a lot of importance in terms of what do you do with your retirement portfolio? What do you do with your investments? That's another big area. And you, then so the you, think, one, you think by investing less in fossil fuel oriented company companies, they will um, do less with through the exploitation of fossil fuels, or will use less fossil fuels? I mean, you're not you're not suggesting that Berkeley diverse from its use of fossil fuels, just well, from its investment in fossil fuels. No, so actually, I am. I'm suggesting both. Um, uh-huh. California is is very much on path to phase out fossil fuels by 2050. So we will be at one third of our energy from renewable energy sources by 2020. Right now, we're talking with the governor and the different branches of government here about targets that will put us more than 50 percent clean energy by 2030. The models that my lab runs, and I have a model of North America, another one of China, one of India, one of Chile, Mm -hmm. so pretty different places we're working. We see this as equally possible in all those places, including China. So talking about decarbonizing our energy mix, but having the financial story follow suit. Mm -hmm. And what I don't want to see is that this becomes a discussion that we somehow need to shun energy companies. Right. They need us and we need them. But I believe they can actually make more money in the long term by transitioning to be clean energy companies, using their expertise now, using natural gas in particular, the way the president said as a bridge. Right. And my worry, for example, is that a lot of people who see very cheap natural gas today say, well, if we simply go from coal to gas, we're done. We're done. Well, gas is a clean fuel if you're in West Virginia or Montana. But gas is already seen as a dirty fuel in California. And so it's not just pivoting to gas. It's using gas as a fulcrum yeah. to get us other fuels. And that's a place where everything from doing carbon audits for one's company, university, or home. I had a meeting with, with former Governor Schwarzenegger a couple of years ago where he said, I want you to build for us a online calculator So that we can not only see how carbon intensive our choices of energy mix, how much carbon is embedded in this bottle of wine, not physically, but in terms of producing it, but also a calculator which is transparent. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was company A decarbonizes. They put their results up and it becomes a challenge for company B. So demanding that kind of information is something that the citizens and students can do. Yep. Yeah. So I'm finishing up a book right now on this transition. Mm-hmm. I'm still having a hard time with the title, but it's more or less called An Optimist's Guide to Energy. But the last chapter is called The Lorax Needs an Accountant. <laughs> and it's really about you know doing this kind of math, which looks complicated today. But you know I can tell you the math of the carbon content and everything from – my energy to this bottle of wine, that is less complicated than a 401k. Mm-hmm. And so I'm convinced we can do it. We just need to make it sort of standard business operating procedure. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great way to, to bring our conversation to a close because I think those are some strong practical things that students could, could uh, ask for, could agitate for. There are things they can do in their own behavior to, of course, use less energy and to encourage the use of more renewable forms of energy. And as you said earlier in our conversation, to encourage the distribution of energy in ways that promote social justice, which is you know, something I don't want to lose from the earlier part of our conversation. So yeah, Dan, thank you so much for, for joining me here in our uh, um, technologically mediated conversation. Uh, I, I, I know the students will enjoy it. And thank you so much for your great work. Uh, thanks for having me do this, and thanks for doing the course. I really like seeing this kind of conversation widen in the ways you're talking about. So congratulations to you for doing this. Thanks. So we've been exploring what the, we know about climate change and, and why we should care. Uh, the videos from the Social Goods Summit, uh, and we have the benefit of uh, Vice President Al Gore um, talking with uh, a, a range of activists and scientists about things they're working on. Uh, those videos will will uh, lead us to uh, 
uh, understand what, more of what we can do to make a difference on, on climate change. Some of it is, again, building a social movement to force our governments, especially in the industrialized world, to actually um, put an appropriate price on the production of carbon so that we, because we will pay the price for carbon in the atmosphere eventually, and those who are using it now, burning it now, bringing it out of the earth now, um, should be uh, uh, assuming some of that burden. We'll also learn more about conservation and what we can do uh, uh, to uh, conserve energy so there's less of a demand on non-renewable forms of energy. We'll also hear about people who are developing new ideas for renewable energy. Um, uh, I'm a particularly um, uh, interested in the video from Ms. Matthews, who uh, uh, is one of the designers uh, of a, uh, a soccer ball. You'll see this that, that uh, contains a battery, and as you play with this ball, the battery gets charged, and that becomes a form of, of uh, energy that uh, can be used in the developing world to, to light up a home or to even um, use uh, for energy for cooking. So we have three fantastic people. Will I am? Woo! Are you ready, darling? Jessica Matthews, who created Socket. <laughs> and Jeff Martin, who created Tribal Brands after spending a long time at Apple with Steve Jobs. So, you guys. How do we turn all that important policy, collaboration, leading from government and industry to something that everybody can connect to and make a difference? Jessica, you had an insight while you were a Harvard student <laughs> to create something that was in a ball. What yeah. was that? Uh, so this is the socket. You guys have seen this all around. And uh, I know we'll do a little bit of a demo later. But what you need to know is that this is a soccer ball, or a football, for those of you who are international. Uh, and it actually harnesses the kinetic energy that's generated during play with the ball and stores it inside of the ball so you can use it as an off-grid power source when you need it. Uh, so, for example, I think I saw Dick and a bunch of everyone just kind of playing around with it. And uh, all you need to do then is just uh, plug it right in. Ooh. Get some light, and uh, you know, 15 minutes of play, 30 minutes of play can give you over three hours of light. Uh, it can power small appliances, cell phones, and whatnot. So we'll we'll probably get to that a little bit later. How cool! She did this as a student; just came up with it as an idea. Her professor did give her an A for the idea. That was good. <laughs> so let me ask you to continue talking about energy because I, I think Jessica starts by by wanting to solve the energy problem by creating something. And our previous panel said it's got to be collaboration. This is something we all have to commit ourselves to. So how do we engage? How do we ask these young people what they can do? How do we ask them how they can come to the table? How, where, do we, where do we translate this issue of energy? Well, I you think so. It's funny. Whenever people say young people, I'm always like, are they talking about me? <laughs> me? Am I still counted? So I'm, I'm 25, right? And the more interns we get at Uncharted Play, I start to realize I'm not as young as I thought I was. Um, but, but still, uh, the question is really, how do you make something palatable? How do you, I think it's the job of private companies, organizations to work in public-private partnerships with government to say, we want to create a system that people want to engage in. And that system, the end goal is good. But if we build it in a way that there's so many obstacles to engage, there's so many reasons why someone would want to say no, um, then they will. I have this theory, and it may be naive, but I think people are essentially good. Um, but our lives are filled with distractions that make it very hard for us to do uh, what we know we should be doing or maybe even what we want to. Um, and so when you take this idea of a soccer ball, actually the idea wasn't necessarily to solve the, the issue, but to address it in a way that made sense to every living person to the extent that the sport of soccer is the most popular sport in the world. Um, and so the idea is, yes, one, to a certain extent, to address the issue, to address the utility for those who are truly dealing uh, with situations where they don't have reliable power, but really to be an educational tool, uh, to go to places like this, to go to places around the world and say, you know, I was able to do this. I studied psychology and economics. Um, you know, thank God for YouTube. Thank God for Wikipedia. Thank God for Google. <laughs> everything you need to figure something out. Um, but ultimately, I am you. You know, I'm a young person who thought this would be exciting, who wanted to create a system that uh, allowed people to 
amplify existing joyful behavior. Uh, and I, I think it's incredibly possible. It doesn't seem overwhelming. And so when you're looking at the energy issue, I think it's about piecing apart the ultimate idea uh, and the issue in a way that makes sense to individuals and allowing them to engage in a way that they want to engage on a daily basis. And hopefully by starting that discussion with something that's very simple and very tangible, now giving them an opportunity to understand the bigger things that are going on. But if you can't bridge the gap between a natural human person's understanding of what's happening in their lives uh, with the bigger picture, you're always going to have that disconnect. Good point. Jeff? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, what is so exciting about uh, the socket ball and uncharted play is that it teaches a young person very quickly that they both consume energy, but they also mm -hmm. create it. Um, and it starts a dialogue that makes you think of energy uh, not necessarily as the zero-sum game that we're sometimes educated through cable TV and, and, and in the journalism industry. And I think you know, one of the things that, that Jessica and I um, and, and the United Nations Foundation and UNDP thought would be really cool is to actually show that not only can a young person generate energy mm -hmm. from a soccer ball, but that we can measure the energy generated from a soccer ball. That in essence, if this ball, much like a cell phone, we can know where it is in the world, and we can know who's kicking it, not from the standpoint of who they are as people, but who's generating energy, and we can measure the proof of that impact, the proof that they're creating energy, then we can transition that through mobile technology to also a hydroelectric plant that the UNDP is working with in Kenya or a cookstove village in Peru. So this starts a conversation, but when you combine that with a cell phone and you show people the energy they're generating and you create a if you will, a leaderboard of who's creating the most energy, that may not solve the problem, but it starts thinking, making people think about education, about careers, about a passion, and, yeah. Yeah, and shows them that ultimately there is a hydroelectric plant the UN is working with in Kenya that supplies all of the sustainable energy for an entire village. So I think this is the catalyst that starts the conversation. I jokingly refer to it as the IMAC of energy because it's accessible and it's, it's a ball. But that conversation doesn't go far if we don't show someone that the energy they generate from this ball, yep. they can get credit for. And we can, if we can measure that, we can almost measure anything. Should we demonstrate that a little bit, Jessica? Yeah, but I want to ask Will yeah. I am a question, because yeah. I think you're saying it really comes back to the individual, and that's your message. I, even I am Angel kind of pulls that up. What do you hear from your fans? Is this something they're hungry for, to, be, to take this on, to take on the ownership of both consumption and production? Well, you, you really have to be careful of how, you're, how the fans pull you in, in my job. So if I listened to what the fans wanted all the time, <laughs> then I wouldn't really be doing this. So if I'm asking somebody to follow me on Twitter, where am I leading you? Where am I taking you? Yeah. We follow people, and we don't even know where they're taking us. So, you know, being inspired by people like Jeff... Um, I've known him since 2001, and he really, really helped, you know, what I choose to do with success. And, um, you know, what I choose to do with success is, you know, encourage young kids to not just dream to be a musician, but, hey, have you ever thought of starting your own business? Have you ever thought of being like, uh, you know, Elon Musk? Don't you want to be like, you know, Sergey Brenner and Larry Page? You know, these are people that, you know, expanded my, you know, concept of what's possible. You know, and right now, everything is possible. Anything you want to do in life, you could actually do it. You want to start a consumer electronic uh, product? You can do that. It's not hard. The only thing, it's probably hard to do it in America. So... <laughs> That gives you a whole new perspective on what it is we have to redefine. If you want to solve energy, I think there's a bigger thing there we have to fix. And what is the competition globally? What are we trying to do as people on the planet? In 1940, after the war, there was a whole new mission on what it is we wanted to accomplish. The American dream was, 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 was brought to existence to where people were fighting to be a part of this new, you know, machine called the Industrial Revolution, even though it started late 1800s. Just look how long it took to kick in. We are in 1913 right now. It's a whole new revolution. It's not industrial. It's technological. So in the, in the next 20 years, everything's going to be a computer, not just a laptop, but everything will be a computer. That being said, where we, what, what is storage? How are we going to store information? 
energy and storage is the most important conversation. But if you're a 12 year old kid and, you, and they're learning code, what company are you gonna work for? Department of Defense or Google? You're gonna work for you know, um, Lockheed Martin or Apple, right? Or your own company. Are you yeah. gonna work for your own company? And if you can have your own company, what services are you gonna bring for the world, toward, towards the world? It's a very important conversation, but 2034, 20 years from now, it's very exciting. That's the reason why I choose to, to use music towards that. Well, let's do some yeah. demos, guys. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you said, um, who knows it's gonna be a computer, and that's a perfect segue because let's, let's say a soccer ball could also be a computer, and I think that, that leads to where we are with this demo because, uh, you know, and I have to give a shout out to my team, two members sitting over sure. there as well. Uh, you know, we, we've known, <laughs> hey, got it, you can't do this stuff alone, right? And so we, for a while, have been really interested in the idea of the quantitative self and what people have been doing to measure. And we said, well, how can we make the soccer ball more and more uh, engaging? And so uh, we looked at the technology, the things with the, you know, the fuel band, jawbone, and whatnot, and said, you know, that tracking tech is actually relatively simple. We know we could put something like that inside of the ball. We know uh, that, you know, we could, at the very least, code an Arduino and say, let's figure out how much time, you know, someone's playing with the ball. Uh, extrapolate that to figure out how much power is being generated. Um, and so it's funny when um, Tribal came along, when Jeff came along and said uh, with the UN, you know, we were thinking about doing this program. We're looking at what can we measure. And we said, you know what, your mobile platform seems perfect to measure something that we've been playing around with. Uh, and I think we can demonstrate it, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Let's you guys get up and do some throwing So here. I'm a, well, you want to join us here? Yeah. I'm not really a, a soccer. <laughs> I'm not, when I say not really, I'm not at all a soccer player. So um, okay. I'm much better at uh, jump roping. So if you want to try like an energy generating jump rope after this, come find me after. <laughs> we can do double dutch <laughs> this, on the other hand. Uh, but if you go ahead and just, you can see where the ball is. And you can then start calculating the minutes of light, LED light, that, that's being generated. Uh, so you want to try it out? Yeah. Pretty well. What, really, sir? <laughs> <laughs> On your head, please. Yeah, yeah. So really Yo, kick it hard, yeah. Woo. Don't 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 tweet that. Don't tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Okay. So the point is if you can measure this, you can measure anything. And that's the point we can make. A soccer ball can be like a cell phone and show proof of impact and the energy being generated. Yo, exactly. imagine every baseball, every football, every <laughs> basketball, every you know, American football in the world was actually when you watch a, a, a sport, a sporting event on television, if these, these systems were put in place, you get to see what's happening, or an athlete was running, and they're like, yo, you're tired, I ain't tired. Man, look, I saw you on the <laughs> field. You sit down, man. <laughs> Your energy's dipping, man. It's amazing stuff is getting ready to come, man. You know when Kobe's messing up and stuff? It's gonna be ill. <laughs> Ten years from now, it's gonna be fresh. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, thirty minutes. So, thirty minutes of play can give you over three hours of light. Um, you know, the fully charged ball can give you over seventy-two hours of light, and again, it can power an array of things, not just a lamp. Uh, and. It's, you know, it's not just limited to soccer balls. Obviously, the World Cup's coming up, and that's something that makes sense. But for us, it's about taking all play and just amplifying that existing behavior. People love to play. You don't have to convince people to play. Right. And it's much easier to teach people about uh, energy issues around the world, about physical activity, about just being more efficient when you do it in a way that they want to do things. Right. And then the feedback is critical. And that's where you are... Experimenting yeah, with some other things. I mean, because it's all about, I've learned this from the UN, it's M&E, you know, monitoring and evaluation. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it, it can start suspending disbelief and saying, okay, we can measure a ball, we can measure maybe all baseballs. I think we would have been in trouble with a baseball here. Can't we? Just more, <laughs> me, more me than you guys. But, um, but then you start looking at showing young people's impact by getting involved with an action and on the funding of a hydroelectric plant with corporate sponsorship and involvement with the UN. Or you're starting to look at a young person measuring an NGO um, in Peru. Yeah. And whether or not the NGO met their need, that's getting funding, you know, supported by the UN. So I think that kind of conversation may start with something as, as, as great as a conversation of ball, but very quickly in mobile, we can actually hold these organizations accountable right. and say, we have to measure your energy or your impact, whether you're the corporation 
you're the UN or the NGO. Ultimately, it's like uh, taking the two most ubiquitous things in the world, right? Like soccer, the most popular sport in the world, and cell phones, the most popular ubiquitous technology yeah. in the world, and putting them together. We uh, need awareness. We need to uh, appropriately price destructive carbon, and we need investigations um, uh, uh, in technology for renewable energy and for mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, in my conversations with um, uh, experts here at Wesleyan, which, you, which we will have here on, uh, on video, um, and in the lectures uh, and, and, and conversations at the Social Good Summit, we'll explore other things we can do to shape um, a response to climate change that makes us all less vulnerable, more active in creating a future uh, with which we can live. Thank you.